Good evening to all of you. This is the webinar on COVID-19 and protection of children from violence, abuse, and neglect in the home. Uh, it's a joint effort between the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, um, UNICEF, and WHO. It's based on a technical note that has recently been released. We'll be briefly presenting the uh, technical note itself. We'll have colleagues from the field who will be sharing their thoughts and, and reflections on what is going on in the field in terms of uh, violence, abuse, and neglect at home uh, during, during this, these times of COVID-19 pandemic. And then we'll hopefully have quite a bit of time for questions and answers for you guys to pose any questions that you may have and for the panel to uh, respond to your questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Cornelius Williams. Cornelius is the Associate Director and Global Chief of Child Protection um, at UNICEF based in New York. I would invite Cornelius to introduce himself beyond his title. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, please share with us your thoughts and remarks. Yes, I'm Cornelius Williams. I'm the Global Chief of Child Protection in UNICEF. Uh, I've been in this field for the last three decades and um, I also have a humanitarian background. I worked in development, worked in East and Southern Africa and virtually all over Africa, but I've never seen anything like this in my career. Uh, that we have a global crisis where virtually all countries are affected and then the challenges that we face. So enough of the introduction, right? Um, let me give a few thoughts actually. So I have three points that I'm going to touch on. I'm going to touch on the, the risk of abuse and neglect in the home, which we feel is heightened. And it's taking place at a time when these may not happen in public view. Children are cut off from public view. And when the family, child and family services are disrupted. We all know that at the best of times, data on the level of violence against children is hard to come by, and even more so in the context of um, COVID-19. So if we have the challenge, it is going to be difficult to get data, but we believe that a clear picture is emerging. On one hand, we've seen that calls to national helplines from children in distress are going up. We take India as an example. India Helpline received more than 92,000 SOS calls asking for protection from abuse and violence in the first 11 days of the lockdown in India. This represents an 11% increase in call. On the other hand, actually, we've also seen data that shows that the report of child abuse and neglect made to child protection authorities uh, have dropped drastically. These are a worrying situation as more children are in need of help, but at the same time, the structures which would usually have supported or served as a reporting mechanism have been weakened and are not there for those children. We know children are already living in violent or abusive situations. They're living in dysfunctional family situation, and we know that dysfunctional family situation provide a high risk for abuse and violence. We know the situation are characterized by complex issues related to the caregiver's mental health, substance abuse, intimate partner violence, and so on. This family situation may deteriorate. We know that, that this family situation may deteriorate further in context of economic stress and things like lockdown and breakdown in the community support mechanisms and results in, in greater regularities and severity of the abuse, frequent abuse. We know that high stress home environment can also be a trigger for new child protection incident. We know that parents may increasingly resort to physical punishment and psychological aggression in response to child behaviors and their own mental and emotional stress. All this is happening right now, out of sight. This heightened risk takes place at a time when children would be less visible to the range of individuals 
and professionals outside of their home who would have normally engaged with them. This includes teachers and other school staff. It also includes community members who are typically the first to raise concern when children are showing signs of abuse and neglect. The COVID-19 containment measures may also cut off the social support that children may rely on when in distress, including the extended community, as I said, friends, and other trusted adults in the community. You know, the child and family welfare services are also disrupted, right? And we know that, and we will hear colleagues talking about that. So these new stresses are occurring at a time when the child and family welfare services are overstretched and have been completely disrupted. We know that actually some of the child and welfare service staff cannot leave their home, that they are working from home. They don't have transport. They don't have the PPE, which has become a common word we all now know about, right? So direct contact with the children and an understanding of the living environment, which is essential to making risk-informed assessment about their safety, we are not able to do it. In the context of social distancing, we are not able to do it. The concern over the safety of the social service worker, the child service, child protection services, has created a challenge in meeting this statutory responsibility towards these children, who were already, some of them were already pre-pandemic, they were already in the caseload, they were already part of child protection register. Now, we cannot do the investigation, we cannot even assess the new cases. This disruption may affect all the vital services, providing support to parents, caregivers, such as substance abuse, support, mental health services, and it may exacerbate the risk factors associated with child maltreatment. We have seen through the media, through the news, we have seen how disruption of the services had led to some high profile case already. Children being killed, high level of sexual abuse. We have seen, we know that it's happening. And so this webinar is timely to get us to understand how we as a child protection community can respond to this crisis. This is a crisis within a crisis. The child protection crisis is a crisis within a crisis. The violence against children is a crisis within the COVID-19 crisis. Annie, I turn over to you, and I look forward to listening to the panelists. Thank you very much, Cornelius. Listening to you, it was very interesting that, as, as you know, within the humanitarian world, we always, uh, we always talk about three different ways that children get affected by, by crises. Um, one being existing um, issues get exacerbated. Um, the second being new issues being created, and the third being protective mechanisms getting disrupted or overstretched. And that's exactly, as I was listening to you, I could really just take each of the sentences that you, you mentioned and put it in each of those categories and see how kind of um, very framed this, this, um, this emergency is and it's all the similarities that it has with all the other humanitarian settings. Uh, thanks a lot, Cornelius, for sharing your thoughts with us and, and framing um, the discussion for us to go forward. So um, myself, I'm Hani Mansourian. I'm the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I'm based in Nairobi. I've been working in the field of uh, protection of children for uh, many years. I, I won't mention the number of years. You can probably see it from my white beard. And I have the pleasure of having worked with um, an outstanding group on this technical note. Also, we will have three um, distinguished speakers. I will just mention their name and then if, if each of you can come on and quickly present yourself. Ala Mograbie, Program Officer of Huras, a Syrian Child Protection Network that works on Syria specifically. Ala, do you mind introducing yourself? Hello, honey. How are you? And hello for everyone. Uh, I am Ala Mugrebia. Um, I am Child Protection uh, Program Officer in the Network. I have been working uh, in the Child Protection for three years now. And uh, I have experienced 
with the COVID-19 as I established and developed uh, some of the guidance and um, uh, technical notes for my organizations and other partners in case management and uh, uh, protection uh, software. Next in line, Bernadette Madrid. Um, Dr. Bernadette is the head of Child Protection Unit at Philippine General Hospital, University of the Philippines in Manila. And she's also the executive director of Child Protection Network Foundation in the Philippines. I'm, I'm Dr. Bernadette Madrid and I'm a pediatrician and I've been working in the child abuse field for 23 years now. And uh, what I'm going to share is our experience in the Philippines on uh, protecting children, especially uh, hospital-based women and child protection units. Thank you. Next presenter will be Neliswa Chekiso. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Neliswa Chekiso. Um, I am the Director for Child Protection in the National Department of Social Development in South Africa. I am responsible for alternative care, that means foster care, child and youth care centers, responsible for child abuse, neglect and exploitation, including prevention and management of violence against children, as well as um, responsible for the management of the National Child Protection Register in the country. Thank you. So these will be the three presenters that will come on and share some thoughts and reflections from the field. Uh, we'll also have, um, when we get to the Q&A, we'll have Kathy Maternowski. Kathy is the lead for data and evidence learning for the Global Partnership to End Violence. I'm happy to be here today and I'll be moderating the q and I'm from the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and I lead data, evidence and learning. Welcome. We also have Berit Kiselpach if I'm again saying it correctly, Technical Officer for Prevention of Violence, Department of Social Determinants of Health at United Nations World Health Organization. Thanks, Rani. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Berit Kieselbach. I'm working since 11 years in WHO, nine of which in the violence prevention team in Geneva, and I focus mainly on the health sector response to violence against children. Then we have uh, Stephen Blight, who is the Senior Advisor for Child Protection, uh, focused on violence against children at UNICEF HQ in New York. Stephen? Uh, first of all, you notice that the photo you have of me is uh, outdated. <laughs> Otherwise, I remain um, Senior Advisor for uh, Child Protection at UNICEF headquarters with a specific uh, thematic focus on uh, violence against children. Thank you. Great, so um, I'll be speaking hopefully for very um, very briefly about the technical note itself. I'll just mention that it was, uh, this was a result of uh, a collaborative process between four entities um, that led the process, as I mentioned, the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, uh, Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and UNICEF and WHO, but there were a lot more um, organizations and individuals behind the development of this technical note. So I just want to recognize that and send the kudos to all of those who, who joined us in this effort, who recognize the importance of the issue of violence, abuse, and neglect at home, and all the, all the issues that Cornelius brought up uh, in his introductory remarks. So the technical note has uh, basically three uh, broad sections in it. The first one just describing the issues of violence, abuse, neglect, and, um, uh, and neglect of children in the context of COVID-19. A lot of it is close to what Cornelius covered. Uh, it's basically outlining how COVID-19 is impacting risk factors that lead to violence, abuse, and, and neglect. And I, risk factors is a, is a key term here in, in that while we have quite a bit of evidence already that, that shows us, and some of it Cornelius mentioned, that violence and abuse and neglect is going up uh, during COVID-19, a lot of it also is, is hidden to us. So what we know is probably only a fraction. And also what we know is only probably a fraction of what we are going to see going forward. And that's why the issue of risk factors becomes really important in that we know based on evidence that there are specific risk factors for violence and abuse and neglect. 
And what we are seeing in this crisis is that a lot of those are being very directly impacted. So it's almost inevitable to unfortunately see continuation of the rise in, in issues around violence and abuse at home and outside. This technical note is particularly focused on home environment. Now that home environment for a lot of children is a very defined four walls and a roof kind of home with, with caregivers in it. For other children, it may be slightly broader than that. It might be streets. It might be an institution where, where they live. It might be uh, armed forces and groups that have recruited them. So it's not a unitary definition, um, even though our, our focus in the technical note has been more on home in, a, in its more traditional sense, but we have tried to, uh, to address and, or touch upon at least on some of the other broader conceptualizations of home. The second component of the, of the technical note addresses the issue of prevention of and response to violence, abuse, and neglect of children at home during COVID-19. It has three um, subsections. One of them is on prevention. How do we, what are the mechanisms and, and approaches that we can, we can activate to make sure that we are preventing as much as possible the increase in, in violence and abuse? Another issue that the evidence from before COVID-19 is telling us is that violence is preventable, at least for the most part. So it becomes very important, and that's why we put it first, that this issue of prevention, it touches upon issues of uh, social norms and how we can influence social norms to, to help better safeguard children at home. It touches upon provision of ac access to, to positive parenting services. And also it talks about uh, the role of schools and education actors in supporting uh, children in distress because of the type of access that they have with them, with children. Uh, it's not necessarily face-to-face -face at the moment, but through a lot of learning programs that are in place, education actors still are among the ones that have quite a bit of uh, access to children. Of course, very different from the traditional access that they have. The second Subcomponent of, uh, of the second section is uh, on identification and reporting. As Cornelius mentioned, part of the problem that we are facing is that children are cut off from all of those individuals and networks um, that, that used to be part of the, the chain of identification and reporting of child abuse and violence. Uh, part of that is schools, part of that is communities, part of that is family members, extended family members that are now not able to play that role anymore. Some of the under-reporting that we see in violence and abuse is, is because of that lack of access. So identification and reporting becomes extremely important because the traditional mechanisms won't function the way they used to function. So strengthening and, and adapting child helplines is one of the issues that has, has been described. As you know, the role of child helplines in this crisis has become very significant. Raising awareness of a range of professionals on, and their roles in identifying and reporting signs of abuse. Um, basically ensuring that health professionals, education professionals, others that are in essential services that are functioning within essential services are aware of what kind of role they have in identifying and reporting signs of abuse and neglect. And of course, also where to report to. Subcomponent of, of section two is on child and family welfare services which is more specific child protection approach to, to this. Uh, some of the sub components in there are support to families in distress. So making sure that those families that are already suffering because of the, um, the containment measures are receiving some level of support to minimize the, the distress um, that can then lead to violence. Designating and supporting child protection as an essential service. Uh, it's something that we have been advocating with all of all of you guys and a lot of partners to make sure that child protection does get classified as, as an essential service within the response to COVID-19. Ensuring the continuity of child and family court services. It's, again, it's, it's crucial to make sure that children don't linger in, in detention uh, and be able to be processed, uh, those that are in touch in conflict with the law. Uh, specialized services for children and families. This subsection touches upon some of the more specialized elements of, uh, of services that children need to, uh, to be able to remain safe and protected. The last section um, quickly is contextual considerations. The reason we thought it was very important to have this section is 
the contextual variability of the issues re related to violence and how depending on where you are in terms of whether you're in a humanitarian context, pre-existing humanitarian context, or in a development context, or in a developed country, your response may be very different. Also, depending on where you are in terms of the outbreak itself and the response to the outbreak, whether you're in containment or, or preparedness uh, has, is very different than if you're in the mitigation or response um, phase where, where a lot of risk kind of strict control measures are in place. Um, so we hope that all, all of you who will be using this specifically pay attention to the contextual element of this so that it, you make it relevant to your context. That's it from my side. I will, um, I'll hand over to Neliswa, Director of Child Protection, Department of Social Development South, in South Africa. I would like to indicate first um, an appreciation um, for the country to be involved in this webinar. I think it's important that as the country we share our strides in ensuring continuity of child protection services in light of COVID-19 pandemic. Immediately that the World Health Organization um, declared um, COVID-19 a pandemic, um, our state president, President Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, declared a national disaster which of course necessitated that as the country, we come up with um, some drastic measures that needs to be implemented across the Republic um, in order to address, prevent, and combat um, the spread of COVID-19. And subsequent to that, this brought about, you know, the national lockdown, which commenced on the 23rd of March. And it took a period of 21 days However, it was further extended until 30th of April. And I need to indicate that there was some relaxation within the measures that were put in place because the lockdown is continuing, um, though we are currently at level four, meaning that it's drastically accommodating, you know, some economic activities within the country just to help us to ensure that whilst we are looking at you know the pandemic the prevention and its management but at the same time we are gradually introducing normality around the economic activities i will further indicate why this is significant as we know that issues of poverty they play a critical role in terms of the violence against children abuse neglect and exploitation as part of the stringent measures that have been um, introduced by the country there are also various structures that have been activated to assist the country in terms of planning and streamlining the work that uh, we are doing whilst ensuring that there's also proper monitoring as well as reporting. And these are managed at different structures or different levels, at provincial, at national, as well as at presidency. When I say provincial, we've got what we call provincial joints. At the same time, we've got the national joints, which is actually the operational leg at national level, which is the National Joints Operations Center, which advises um, the National um, Command Center for COVID-19. And this command center is actually chaired by the president himself. And it's important that these structures are in place so that we can ensure that the work is streamlined. And I'm glad that Cornelius highlighted some of the risk factors, which also, honey, in terms of the technical note you also talked to, that um, there are certain factors that are contributing at the vulnerability of children. And I would highlight some of the measures that as the country we have put in place to mitigate these risk factors. Let me start by indicating that we developed what we call the risk adjusted strategy because we needed to bring some balance between the social impacts as well as the reduction of community transmission. The social impact is actually looking at all the risk factors and which programs could be implemented, taking into consideration the social ills that are impacting negatively on our communities and children are amongst those vulnerable groups that get impacted. 
And I need to indicate as well that whilst we looked at this risk adjusted strategy, we considered a number of principles which are in line with our constitution, which is the right to life, to dignity, to education, equality, equity in education, as well as other socioeconomic rights. And we understood that as we are implementing the risk adjust adjusted strategy, certain programs need to be introduced. And I will highlight some of these programs. First of all, we know that social protection is key if we want to prevent and manage violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation against children, as we have already had on the technical note, as well as you know, the opening remarks by Cornelius, issues of poverty. We have introduced the food distribution program, which actually has been there for a long time in the country. However, it was enhanced. The enhancement that I'm, that I'm talking about is the introduction of the social relief of distress COVID-19 grant, which is a grant that will run for a period of six months. It has started now in May month up until October to assist families because we understand that families are in distress and when they're in distress, there could be a number of you know, stresses as well as um, possible abuse that could take place in households when parents and caregivers are lacking the capacity to really take care of their loved ones. With the introduction of the lockdown, I need to indicate that facilities, including our community nutrition development centers, mm -hmm. the drop-in centers, the partial care facilities, these facilities were closed. However, services that were rendered in these facilities, we needed to make sure that the communities, especially children, they benefit because most children, they are receiving, you know, the school-based nutrition. And at the same time, with the lockdown now, it means that they won't be able to really receive these services. Therefore, we introduced mm -hmm. the knock and drop measures in households so that children can continue to have the meals that they were receiving whilst they could attend CNDCs, which is the Community Nutrition Development Centers, as well as drop-in centers and other, you know, uh, community-based facilities. I need to indicate that we got a special group of children that tend to be neglected. And during this time, these are the children that would be most vulnerable, that is children with disabilities. So in terms of mitigating and ensuring that um, there is provision on how we protect these children. We have provided safety and protection guidelines, which are even, you know, shared through various platforms. And these were also included in the amended regulations that were published on the 2nd of April, 2020. Child protection is actually declared in the country as a special service, which cannot be seen on certain occasions. Thus, we call it a 365 days child protection campaign. And this commenced um, in 2019 with the support of UNICEF, um, UNICEF office in the country. And this program, it's continuing. Though we cannot physically go there and um, have face-to-face -face and have those um, social mobilization campaign, physical in communities. We are using other platforms such as media to ensure that, you know, during this COVID-19, children are still receiving the necessary protection, though we know that it's difficult because they are behind closed doors and the measures that they used to have, which would help and assist in terms of identification and reporting, they are limited. However, true you know, media, radio stations, they will be able to get the messages and also contact the different helplines, which we have made um, available during COVID-19. And even on our televisions, on radio station, we continuously flag these hotlines so that people can be able to reach out, especially children. And uh, one of those lines is our child lines of Africa. Another measure that we have also put in place it will also be important for us to note that our courts, because we understand that um, children in need of care and protection, 
you know, children in alternative care, they need to be prioritized. And in this case, you know, courts have been ensured that they are. I need to also include that in terms of other programs and measures that we have put in place, we have education, which we have tried to make sure that the online is introduced, though we understand that those in the deep rural remote areas, they might not be able to have access to this. Hence, we also consider the issues of radio stations because real, if we talk about the protection of rights of children, we need to understand what are those rights and promote those rights broadly and also ensure that protected and promoted. Water and sanitation is also one of the important uh, measure that we have put in place to ensure that water is distributed in various communities, especially in the rural areas, to ensure that hygiene and compliance with COVID-19 guidelines in schools, it is implemented. And we also know that um, alcohol contributes a lot. And I believe that what we have put as a measure in the country has assisted the banning of alcohol, including tobacco, because it's got, it's got all those risks that are associated with the use of substance abuse. Uh, in terms of information and sharing through media, broadcasting on television, we have produced child-friendly information brooches because we also believe that it's important that we reach each communities. And through the food parcels that we are distributing, we are aiming that these leaflets and brooches will be put into the food parcels that we are bringing to the communities. And another important, important aspect which we might lose sight of, especially when we speak about the online learning, it's the risk associated with cyber cyber crimes, cyber bullying, and all these activities. And in that case, as the country, we do have a cyber bullying brochure that we have put out there so that we can empower parents, including children, to ensure that um, there are safety within their homes in case that there are you know, perpetrators and predators that would uh, take advantage of those online activities for children through learning. In conclusion, uh, colleagues, I would like to indicate that as the country, we are really committed to, to protect and promote the rights of children and with partnering with the various stakeholders in the country to ensure that we implement programs that will benefit children across South Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly Swat. It was really interesting to hear such a comprehensive approach to the protection of children in South Africa. Um, and also uh, some of the examples that you gave in uh, addressing the risk factors um, in, in terms of poverty, in terms of the regulations that you have in place around alcohol consumption. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Bernie Madrid. So uh, just to put in context, the Philippines has 7,100 islands. So the case of uh, the COVID situation in all of these islands is different. For, you know, it's not the same in all of the islands. So my discussion will be centered on areas where uh, COVID-19 cases are very high and that the provinces are in complete lockdown. I think when you say context, uh, we should place uh, the context because as you will see in my report, I will keep on referring to the technical report. We are implementing it in the Philippines. So I think if you ask anyone before COVID, uh, whether survival, development, protection, or participation can be indivisible, the answer, yeah, it's definitely indivisible. But we are now tasked to make hard choices. When all resources, when all budget, manpower, everything is now centered on survival. And I think it makes sense because people are afraid to die. And so the, the question of what is essential, what should remain functional, what should still be funded, where resources should be placed, it becomes very competitive. And as we know, we all, being child protection workers would say that child protection is an essential service and should remain so during this COVID. But we have to fight for that to remain an essential service because the experience of even just social distancing is different per family, 
That's why I have this picture here. How can an average poor family in the Philippines with eight people living in a one room affair have social distancing? Now, the question is, uh, is this a risk factor for abuse? And uh, you will see later in my report that while we say abuse is increasing, it's not all abuse, it's certain types of abuse. When we look at who are the frontliners for child protection in the Philippines, we see here we have doctors, social workers, law enforcement officers, and the barangay, the community, the people in the community. And we realized during COVID how valuable the people in the community are, especially during lockdown, when there's no transportation, when people are forced to stay home. So we're very reliant on these people who are right there in the community for the identification and for, to help children access services during this time. Of course, there's technology, you know, cell phones. More and more, we realize that we have to rely on cell phones and the internet for us to be able to reach these homes. So services have to be transformed and education has to be transformed to be able to be delivered online. And in the Philippines, for example, the penetration of uh, the internet is quite high. Almost, you know, everybody has a smartphone now, even those who are poor. Then we go into hotlines. We know that we have to expand helplines and hotlines, but what are we seeing? There is some slight increase in reports in hotlines, but only very slight in the Philippines. And these are reports of physical abuse, not really sexual abuse. But when you look at the hospitals, the women and child protection units and the police, the children who actually get there, especially during lockdown, when there's no transportation, when they cannot get out of their homes, has been drastically low. So actually, Alex Buchar just, just sent me an email asking about whether reports are low. Yes, reports are low, very low, like only 10% of what we used to have. And I don't think it's because abuse has decreased. It's really because the children cannot report, cannot get out there. And so we must find ways and means to reach these children or for them to be able to reach out so that they can be helped. And again, we talk about the internet and smartphones. Radio and TV, well, good for education, but even then, you know, you know we're still developing them. Uh, we're looking at how we could transform our parenting programs, for example, to be heard on radio or to be seen on TV. Education materials, how to get them to the children. We're looking at uh, those who distribute food. You know, if you could also include there the education materials. And we talk about protecting the children. We should also educate good Samaritans, neighbors, bystanders, because the patients, some of the patients that we see who have been abused in the hospital was able to reach us because of these good Samaritans or neighbors who were able to witness or were able to uh, reach the child. I think no matter what we do, you know, we have to realize that we have to transform the services that we are giving now. This COVID situation will last at the minimum two years, if not three years. And when we talk about safety, it's not only safety for the children, but also safety for the workers. And I think one of the reasons why the children were afraid to seek help from the hospital is because they're afraid to go to the hospital because they might get COVID, you know. So how do you protect them and how can they be sure, you know, and feel confident that they won't get COVID because that's part of the problem, you know. So as you can see here in the picture, you know, now the workers are wearing PPEs and even the patient, uh, is wearing a PPE. And when we talk about follow-up, we will be using a lot of cell phones and we're going to use telemedicine. Even delivery of follow-up counseling might be through 
telemedicine, case conferences may now be through Zoom. You know, so that's why I call people Zoombies because everyone is just Zooming, you know. So uh, we're now looking at how we are going to transform everything that we're doing to the new normal where we know that a lot of these face-to-face -face meetings will have to be done in a different way. We, uh, or, you know, you have to choose, you know, how do you keep social distancing and how do you get there in those areas where it's very difficult to get to nowadays. So I think that when we talk about the new normal, we have to reimagine everything that we do so that both the workers, as I said, and the children would feel safe. And we talk about safe, there are different levels of safety also, like there are different levels of PPEs. So I will stop here and uh, maybe later on during the open forum, I will answer uh, some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette, uh, for some of those reality checks also uh, in terms of what people are dealing with and how much of the measures are actually feasible. Without further ado, I hand over to Ala Mograbie, um, the program officer from Horas, um, a national organization that works on Syria. I would like to also um, introduce you to the Northwest Syria context as well, so, so we can understand how uh, we've used the technical note and how it was, uh, <coughs> it was really beneficiary in our uh, response guidance. So the Northwest Syria area is uh, under the opposition control and it's, it has been an, uh, an active area of uh, conflict for nine years now. There are 4.1 million people living in Northwest Syria. 80% of the children that we work with are living in a, a camp setting. You can have an idea how the situation and uh, the environment uh, really poor and the infrastructure for the people there is very weak. So with the COVID-19, it's uh, becoming a red flag for the all protection actors, for children to on how to protect them and how to respond for them uh, with this overcrowding areas and the poor conditions that children are living in. What we have done and how the uh, COVID-19 has affected us, the COVID-19 was uh, announced as an um, emergency response with the beginning of March with the health directorate announcing it and the education directorate uh, closing the schools since uh, March 2020. Before that, we have been able to reach 148,000 children and only 90% of them are currently reached through a distance learning and distance psychosocial support programs. This is going to be the first recommendation for us is that we've created routines for children in order to make them calmer and build their resilience better in this hard situation. This is what I'm going to explain later. Until now, and because of mainly a lack of uh, testing tools uh, for the COVID-19, until now there has been no confirmed cases in Northwest Syria. However, the emergency response has been uh, announced. Uh, we are in the uh, preparation period since two months now. So as I mentioned, the, the technical note that uh, Hani has uh, talked about has been really a good guidance for us. And uh, upon uh, its issue, we've decided to establish a protection monitoring mechanism during COVID-19 in order to detect trends, concerns, child protection uh, uh, threats uh, among uh, children during the pandemic. Uh, the tool is going to target teachers, parents, and committees, uh, as well as uh, health workers to detect some uh, trends, uh, not only violence against children or neglect, but also uh, separation and uh, child labor and uh, child marriage during the pandemic. However, in order to establish uh, the mechanism, uh, we've done a quick survey, which we distributed over 30, 31 communities, those committees are uh, specialized in child protection. The sample was very small and it only took opinions and observations of people who answered this 
uh, survey. However, it gave us uh, a good uh, idea on how to direct the mechanism uh, that we are going to publish in the upcoming uh, days. So 45% of them said that they witnessed uh, violence against children in the last month. And uh, majorly, there are no difference in gender. However, um, there has been a good percentage among them reporting uh, that uh, boys were subjected to violence more than girls. 86% of those reporters has uh, also said that age uh, from 5 to 13 years old were uh, more subjected to violence than uh, children under uh, 5 or uh, older than uh, 14. And when we ask them uh, who are the people, uh, children that they can uh, go to to report this violence and uh, seek protection, uh, the CP actors, teachers and PSS workers uh, came in third place after um, extended family and family members to protect them if the violence uh, or neglect has uh, happened uh, to them. So this is not only has helped us in the studies that uh, study that we are going to conduct, but also has shed some lines on the response that, should, that we are going to do and we've done. Like we have uh, to focus on what age group and uh, uh, the means of um, communications with the children, how to be uh, more focused uh, on the uh, teachers and PSS workers as they are uh, a safe line for those children. So our response uh, came in different stages depending on the vulnerability of, the, of those children and how we are going to reach them. Uh, so as I said, the first thing that we recommend is to build routines for the children as routines make uh, children calmer and more resilient. So our PSS and education activities are linked to a routine and specific key points of the day. So every day, for example, at 8 a.m., we share uh, the math lesson. And on, um, at uh, 6 p.m., uh, for example, we share the physical exercises. Uh, we have ensured that those lessons and uh, uh, the homeworks are really easy and uh, simple. So the parents, when they are helping their children, uh, are not frustrated and not to create more pressure on them. This was uh, really uh, beneficial. 90% of the children that we, uh, we were reaching before the COVID-19 are, uh, ben uh, are benefiting from the service. Uh, it's uh, started to show uh, some good results in terms of uh, their resilience. And our, as an entry point uh, to those children, uh, to help them report anything as they have a continuous support uh, from their teachers and the PSS workers and also social workers and CP actors uh, entering those portals. So for the next uh, uh, response line was uh, homeschooling and PSS kids. And this was mainly targeted to children who uh, don't have an access to smartphones or uh, laptops and cannot enter the portals uh, online uh, on a regular basis. So they were supported with, uh, with the kids and uh, they were complemented with the uh, parenting skills brochures and leaflets. This was very good for us as an entry point for those children because we've lost uh, the c connection with them in the portal. So this has helped us to at least uh, check on them uh, when we are handi handing them the kids and to see uh, their environments and um, uh, do an assessment on them when, while they are uh, having the kids on a monthly basis, at least when they are uh, up, when we are updating those kids and providing them with the new uh, supplies. Like we did the uh, disability inclusion uh, in both those programs, so uh, the children with disabilities were were included in those uh, program with the special uh, education programs and special PSS manuals directed not only for the children but also for their parents and able to be uh, able to deal with them in this period as uh, they are in, in long hours of contact and just to help them with uh, some tips on how to deal with your children and how to make them 
Palmer and how to build uh, the routines in order to support the family during uh, these times. So not only um, the materials were simple, but we uh, ensured that to, uh, to make it a family in uh, inclusive to all family members and uh, fun and interactive. We depended also on the teachers and the school social workers uh, to call the parents and the children who were registered in their schools, uh, as well as the school PSS facilitators. So they called weekly on the children uh, to check up on them and uh, provide support if needed, not only individually, but also in a group settings uh, to detect trends and uh, to reach children as much as possible. So this also targeted the children uh, who don't have an access to smartphones to be reached through uh, their parents' phones or um, uh, the neighbors' phones just to check up on them and make sure that they are safe and uh, not needing for any uh, more support. We've uh, targeted residential care uh, centers with uh, awareness raising and PSS uh, support to the children as well as the uh, workers in those centers on uh, ch children's rights and child protection uh, uh, during COVID-19 in order to decrease the rate of violence against children during this uh, period. Uh, at last, uh, we uh, intensified the case management follow-ups uh, and visits uh, to all open cases as they are the most vulnerable children among uh, the targeted uh, population. We've uh, equipped uh, all our uh, staff with PP, uh, PPEs and uh, with guidance on how to conduct uh, those uh, visits during the COVID-19, as well as uh, they were supported with uh, individual protection assistance and in-kind assistance to support families who cannot do the quarantine or they were affected with the COVID-19 emergency in order to decrease uh, the, uh, the pressure and tension on the parents and uh, an attempt to decrease a violence against children. So we have complemented all those programs with the raising awareness uh, programs to teachers, caregivers and children, as well as health workers. And we have activated hotlines for the violence and uh, neglect among all those uh, centers and all uh, those uh, targeted populations. Thank you. Concrete example from a humanitarian context. Uh, Katy, over to you. Great, thank you everybody. Um, thank you very much to the presenters. That was fantastic to get the um, updates from the field so that we really have a pulse on what's happening. And um, thank you participants. I see that you're actively beginning to um, put, enter your questions. And we hope that collectively we can respond to those. Super happy to be here from the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. All right, so let's get on to the questions now. Um, the first one comes from Faiza. I'm not sure where Faiza is from. She's asked a really important question about the socioeconomic impact of COVID and how um, panelists um, are dealing with that in their country settings or in their agencies. I think that um, we know that the pandemic has huge social and economic consequences that we're seeing worldwide, and, but that it will hurt some children more than other children. And that I think that there's a lot that goes on related to this note where there's an intersection between um, income, um, potential poverty from the loss of income or already low income, and as well as poor housing, because this note did focus on housing, um, with the com common denominator being that children in poorer families are more exposed to violence. So I am going to um, look at this socioeconomic question and pass it to one of our panelists. I think I'm going to start with um, Bernie. If you can tell us a little bit about the, soci the, the influence of socioeconomic impact and how you think it might be dealt with in the context of the Philippines. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, we are dealing not only with the old poor, but we're also dealing with the new poor. I call them the new poor because these are people who have jobs, but now because of COVID, they're out of a job. And, there could, and, that, and we may, the number of that, we still have no idea because it is ever increasing. So many people have lost their jobs. And, uh, and also when in, in terms of the impact on the children, since right now, you know, school has stopped. 
uh, the problem is that a lot of these children who previously were in private schools may now not be able to afford private school, again, because of the situation of their family, uh, their parents now being out of jobs. You know, so, so of course, uh, government really has to play a critical role there, both in policy and in, uh, in actual concrete help. So in policies, for example, in the Philippines, we're talking about postponement of paying, payment of utilities like electricity, water, rent, you know, that's for, for everyone, and that you cannot uh, evict people at this time of COVID, even if they cannot pay their rent. And then when we talk about cash transfers, uh, that has increased. Uh, we, we have like at least uh, 4 million, if not more families uh, that are part of the conditional cash transfer program. Uh, but now that has even been increased. And so we have um, cash transfers, not only for this poorest of the poor, but also the poor and now even up to the middle class and you have the senior citizens. So that's why in my first slide, I was saying that the country is so unprepared for this. There, has been, there was no budget for this. And now it has taken the budget for the rest of the year. So even the, it's eating on the savings of the country. That's why uh, private, you know, the help of the private sector is really needed. And the private sector, I'm happy to say, in the Philippines have stepped up in terms of uh, helping the, their employees, as well as with uh, all the other needs in terms of food, which is really basic, you know, and um, PPEs, again, helping the frontliners. And, um, you know, um, I cannot say, you know, uh, how, what else, you know, because this, as I said, this can go on for two to three years. So uh, we, we have to be ready, the, uh, the economists have to be ready. It's, sometimes it's a balance between uh, early opening up of the lockdown, you know, because of the economy versus the lives of people, because you know you are putting them at risk and that there may be another surge of COVID. So these are all very difficult decisions to make. And as I said, this is where government and the private sector just have to work together. So meanwhile, with all of these increased stresses, we are Great. going to see really increases in abuse. Okay. Great. Thank you, Bernie. Um, all right, good. We had um, a question about healthcare access and how to actually improve that when, as Cornelius had pointed out, that social welfare and healthcare workers can't get to work. Um, this is also an issue in rural and remote areas where people can't even get that access. Um, healthcare, and when we think about healthcare, we're thinking about the, the effects of the violence, the physical and physiological effects of violence, but we're also thinking about mental health care, right? So I'm gonna put that question to one of our esteemed panelists, Barrett, who works with the World Health Organization, to tell us a little bit about some of the um, the ways that we're moving forward with helping with access to healthcare. Barrett? Okay, thanks a lot for this question. And yeah, thank you very much um, to our participants. Um, I think I saw two questions related to access to healthcare. One was about literacy and how to um, transmit information to people who are illiterate, who are not able to read or write. Um, and there I can just quickly say there's a lot of um, information that's currently developed to um, make sure this kind of information is really available to everybody. There's a lot of infographics without text or with, with, um, uh, with very little text. And um, there's uh, a whole lot of work around health literacy uh, dealing with this problem also for other health problems. So that might be um, an interesting um, approach to look at. The other is, um, yeah, we see there's certainly um, overburdening of the health sector with the, the spike of COVID-19 cases, but there's also other parts depending on the setting um, of the health sector where, where there's less, um, yeah, less impact. Um, if you're talking about psychosocial or mental health services, that's of course an area that's 
um, very much underfunded in many settings, um, but we have seen examples um, how people are trying to maintain services, especially for, for children that are at very high risk. So I think we have seen in many countries that people try to focus on those children that are at, at the highest risk that, um, for example, younger children that don't have any opportunity to seek services themselves. Um, to focus on families uh, that have where has where there has been pre-existing violence, uh, I think um, Bernie also um, mentioned and uh, and Melissa as well mentioned uh, children with disabilities who, who are already at four times higher risk of violence in normal times and might be might be uh, have less chances to to ex access services. Um, but um, but we, we see it's a it's a it's a huge um, problem that, that children are not um, receiving that services right now. But we are recommending to those who um, who offer health services uh, related to COVID nineteen is to alert, for example, people in testing centers or um, th that are um, uh, uh, at the at the entry level of hospitals to alert them about uh, a heightened risk for child abuse and neglect. Thank you, Barrett. Um, very helpful. Lots of great suggestions there. Um, the next question is for Ala, and it comes um, from a person named Tabit, and it's um, inquiring about the quick survey tools that you used with your child protection committees. I think all of us are quite interested in this. How to really get a quick read on the, um, the actions and issues on the ground with, with child protection committees, which of course are so vital to the work of the system. We'd like to hear about the tool, the survey that you use with the child protection committee, and also if that tool is available to share with our audience. Yeah, as I said, uh, the survey that was done, it was uh, really on a, a small uh, sample uh, of uh, people, and it was really quick just to uh, put in mind uh, the tool that we are uh, going to, uh, the mechanism that we are going to distribute in the upcoming days. So it's not really a reliable uh, source of information, but whenever we are finished with the study and uh, uh, we finish the mechanism that we are going to distribute in the upcoming days, uh, we, are, we are going to be really happy to share um, the findings of the study that uh, we'll have. Great, thank you, Ella. Um, we have a question here from Florence with the Norwegian Church Aid in Oslo, um, and she is asking about uh, potential increases in um, child and or forced marriages as a result of the lockdowns related to COVID-19. Um, I'm going to pass this to one of my UNICEF colleagues on the panel because I think that they have done some work on this, at least I thought, thought I saw a note on this. Um, Cornelius or Stephen, do you want to take that? that question if there's any um, increases in child and or forced marriages as a result of COVID or is the data too scarce yet to know? Um, it, it's Stephen here and let me try and give um, uh, a quick response. And well, the quick answer is, um, is we don't know. And um, given data challenges linked to, you know, lockdowns and uh, the relative invisibility of children to public services during the pandemic we don't know and we and we don't have uh we don't have that uh, data but what we um do know is those kinds of um services um that support adolescent girls those kinds of uh, services that prevent child marriage are uh, are interrupted Okay, and, um, and, and so this is our concern is how can we ensure that those basic services are um, resume or are maintained in the, in the context of the lockdown? Thanks. Super. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we have a question here that I think is a really critical one, and that is, are we listening to the experiences of children during COVID? Now, this, of course, comes with many... Um, um, barriers, right? Even more than before, because we've got ethical issues we need to think about. Um, it's not as easy to get to children through the um, various children's rights groups that we normally function through um, and work with children. So um, do any of the panelists um, want to 
Naliswa, maybe you've been working on that in South Africa. I don't know. Um, again, Bernie, maybe you have ex some experiences of, are we actually listening to children on the ground and can we get their experiences and can that inform our practice? Um, you know, that's why when I, my first slide, I had the four, survival, development, protection, and participation. Mm -hmm. I think among the four, participation is probably the, the least, you know, the one that uh, we paid the least attention to. Um, but I was thinking, you know, that uh, it will be nice to also have a webinar, actually. I was suggesting that to one of our groups. You know, I'm a, I'm a, that to have a webinar we're in, it will be the youth now speaking uh, instead of us, the elderly. So, um, uh, so because we really do need to, to hear their voice. But mm -hmm. right now, I think we were just so taken aback by sudden lockdowns that uh, we were not able to reach the youth uh, immediately, but, uh, but, we'll, but we'll get there. So, so that's my answer for now. Mm. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, if I may come in the, um, in, in South Africa, we have managed to get the voice of a child and, you know, pa child participation, particularly on the school, because it was around the education. And I support Benny's view in relation to actually having a webinar with children to really get to hear their voices in terms of their experiences and what they would like to see us doing as countries in relation to prevention of violence, child abuse, neglect and exploitation. And in South Africa, we do have you know, child ambassadors in different provinces. We've got, we've got nine provinces and each province we've got child ambassadors whom we can actually utilize with our child participation framework to actually, you know, get their views and understand even if it's some, some sort of a survey that could be done so that we can be able to say, you know, we are operating or implementing strategies that are informed by, you know, voices of children. Great, thank you so much, both of you. That's very helpful. Um, and I'm sure that there, I think, I, I think the idea of a um, webinar um, is, a, is a fantastic one. Just start to, li to listen to kids and make sure that they're, you know, we're, we're practicing good ethics when we are listening to them and making sure that they have backup services um, because that's so important with the children's experiences. Um, the um, Global Partnership will be doing a podcast with children hopefully in the future. So we'll keep everyone posted on that. Um, we have some, we have two questions from Mathilde and from um, M. Yurima from Nigeria about residential care um, facilities. And I think when we think about residential care, it's not technically the home, but it is a home for many children, right? And, and conditions in residential care um, situations can be bad anyhow, the, the, but then also they are probably, as Bernie put, um, transforming under the COVID um, situation. Um, there's often crowding, um, difficult conditions, and children are left without the services that they may need. Um, maybe one of our panelists, I, you can put your hand up, panelists, if you'd like to take this, um, <laughs> would like to um, address this issue about residential care. I know that, Allah, you, we, maybe we could start with you, Allah, because you did have residential care on your pyramid of needs um, that, you, that you showed us. Um, maybe you could tell us what's happening in Syria, and then we could move on from that. Thank you. For the residential care and interim care centers, when uh, uh, before the COVID-19, they were actually um, very hard to uh, work with because they work ind independently. And since we don't have any authorities in our uh, opposition uh, health area, uh, it's really challenging to work with them. However, uh, we are doing our best to uh, uh, include them in our response and to give them the guidance uh, on how to do their preparation and how to do their response during the COVID-19. Harath uh, uh, Network along with other uh, partners are visiting those uh, residential care uh, centers and uh, trying to guide them on how to uh, receive new cases uh, if needed, and how uh, what uh, measures they should take uh, in case um, 
uh, a COVID-19 case was detected uh, within their uh, facilities. Uh, however, as I said, uh, there is a huge challenge in uh, working with those uh, facilities as they are uh, really close and they don't uh, allow uh, a lot of actors uh, to visit them. Uh, but we are doing our best. Thank you, Ella. Um, so in closing, I'd like to go through each panelist and just have you give a very brief, right? What you think perhaps is the most important thing to do now in terms of either policy or practice to pr protect children um, and, and putting it in the context of the technical note and that would be protecting children in the home, right? Um, during this COVID, um, COVID context. I think it's policy, no doubt that we really have to make child protection an essential service. I mean, that's a no brainer. In terms of the work, I think we really have to transform the way we work in that we really need to develop an online platform. There's no choice the way I feel it. We need telehealth and uh, we need to arm our children with uh, an option to access care. And one of that is that they should have at least a cell phone. I mean, the most practical thing is that they should have a cell phone. I think we should be prepared that we are going to change the way we work in the next three years, and that we should do it now. So thank you. For me, it's more on practice in terms of, because I mean, our policies in the country are quite good, if I am I to say so, uh, intensifying our social mobilization through electronic you know, communication where we must empower parents and caregivers to take better care of, it, of, of their children because I believe that's how we can ensure that um, we prevent violence against children, child abuse, neglect and exploitation, especially in the homes during this period of lockdown and COVID-19. Thank you, Katie. As you said, it's, it's hard to, but I'll just focus on this one on violence. I think I like what Bernie said, actually, the issue of that we have to learn now how to work um, in a more, all the lessons learned about remote working, we should build on that for the next, you know, what is digital social work mean, especially in under resource settings. All right, and, and I just want to bring up very quickly, you know, still a good portion of the world does not have digital access, so that will be a challenge in and of itself. Um, Barrett, what would be your closing remarks? Um, first, I would like to echo what um, Bernie said. I think we need to make sure that child protection is an essential services and that people who are at risk reach the services they need. And the second is I think we need a better understanding what's actually happening. We have seen in some countries reports are increasing, in some countries they are decreasing. We have some idea which types of violence increase, we have some idea which might decrease, but to really provide services to those most, at needed, um, most needed, we, we need to have a, a bit better information um, of the situation that's actually happening at home. Great, thank you. Super important to keep the surveillance going. Um, Stephen, um, as the lead of Violence Against Children and, and, and really one of the senior leaders of child protection in UNICEF, what would be your number one recommendation? Well, I would um, build on Cornelius's point about how um, provision of child protection services have to adapt during the um, pandemic and use such things as more ways of using um, virtual means for case management, but we always have to keep in mind that um, children are, who are at high risk and who are um, experiencing violence that could cause significant harm, there is a state obligation, there's an obligation on us to conduct those family um, visits, those assessments of the situation of the child that require face-to-face um, -face contact. So these need to be um, prioritized, prioritized and maintained. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Allah, are you still with us? Just to uh, be as flexible as, uh, as possible and adapt whatever you have uh, resources in mind and uh, not to leave uh, children with disability behind. Thank you, everyone. Great, that's a great closing comment on flexibility and adaptation. That's what we need to do now. 
I'd like to thank um, all of the participants, first and foremost, for joining us today. Sorry that we're slightly over time. Um, and secondly, um, the panelists, um, our two presenters from South Africa and the Philippines, thank you very much for bringing the reality of the field back up to us um, in our various places in the world. And then to um, our other panelists, Stephen and um, Barrett, for joining. Thank you very much, Cathy, and everyone uh, for, your, for your comments, for your questions, for being with us on this uh, Friday afternoon, especially Ala during uh, Ramadan for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Uh, we, we hope that this was useful and we hope to see comments and reflections from you guys and hopefully we'll follow up on some of the recommendations such as the webinars that were suggested. Uh, please go out and help us protect children who are affected by this crisis. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a good weekend.